Um, now, Inspector Kelly knew what I thought concerning uh, the Secret Service. And I knew that the Secret Service were probably out drinking the night before, and I just suspected it. I highly suspected it, and it and it came to be in actuality, just like I said it would be. Well, it's in Jim's book, Crossfire. They, they yeah. were. They were up till 5 in the morning, some of them, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah and, that's right. And I, yes, and I can tell you for sure there, there was a big cover-up there because they were up till 5 in the morning drinking uh, hard liquor, uh, mixed drinks called salty dicks which are uh that uh, composed of vodka and grapefruit juice and the reason i know this is so is because even though the owner of the cellar the bar or the night spot that they were uh, in uh signed an affidavit along with other people saying that they couldn't have been getting drunk because they did not have a liquor license and could not sell liquor that technically that was true but Pat Kirkwood, the owner of the cellar there in Fort Worth, uh, has been described to me by Fort Worth Police as the Jack Ruby of Fort Worth. He knew all the cops, he knew all the reporters, he knew all the city of county officials. And if you were anybody, uh, you would go to his club and he would give you an alcoholic drink for free, okay? Currying favor with all the people in authority. Uh, and how do I know this is true? Because as a teenager in high school, I was hanging out with some of the older reporters, and we went to the cellar, and I got some alcoholic drinks there. What? because I Yeah, because I happened to be with them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and it not only was it illegal for them to give alcohol since they didn't have a liquor license, but uh, neither say I was underage. <laughs> so they anyway. Didn't, they didn't even encourage you, huh? Well, no, because I was with a bunch of older, a bunch older reporters. You, had one. I, you know me, Jeff. I've always been old. You had, that's right. <laughs> I was you were, born old. No, mature. Uh, you had right, to, now, I've also got to say that when we come to uh, Oswald as an FBI informant, uh, this is not just some idle speculation. It's not just some uh, conspiracy theory that Abraham Bolden dreamed up. At the time of the Warren Commission, the Attorney General of Texas, Wagner Carr, uh, came to them and presented information and said that Oswald had they had a file and showed he had been an FBI report uh, informant and gave his informant number S one seventy nine, okay, and said he was receiving two hundred dollars a month uh, as an FBI informant uh, working for the U.S. government, uh, which his mother always said. Margarita Oswald said to me many times when I was in her home, my son worked for the United States government, okay. And so, and of course, the Warren Commission said, "Oh well, no, no, that can't be right." Um, and then they uh, they asked Alan Dulles, said, "Well, you used to be head of the CIA. If uh, Oswald had been a member of the CIA, would you tell us about that?" And he said, "No." <laughs> and they went, "Oh, okay. So there's no use in us asking Jagger Hoover." And that was as far as it went. Wow. Well, all right. Let's. We have about six minutes or so left. Six seven minutes. Mr. Bolden, tell us what happened to you and what. We're trying to help you gain right now what this is all about. Well, as I uh, state in my book, Echo from Dealey Plaza, when I tried to appear before the Warren Commission, I was hustled back to Chicago here, trained, and sent away to prison. Now, this was all con concerning a uh, memo by uh, Kazenbach at the time. That I, I didn't know that this memo existed, and it was dated November the 25th, 1963, where the cats and back acting as the acting attorney general, uh, because Bobby Kennedy was was out of office at that time, uh, states in a, in a memo to uh, Mr. Myers, Myers that uh, the public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates who are still at large, mm -hmm. and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. So you can see that he is the Attorney General of the United States of America, saying that no matter what, the Warren Commission, who had not been appointed yet, but was directing the investigation towards an end. And anyone that has any investigative uh, experience at all know that you can't investigate a thing from a conclusion that's already in <laughs> no. your mind. You have to be open-minded about it. Now, when I went to uh, give my little testimony before the Warren Commission, I didn't know that this memo existed. 
So actually, what I did was walk into a trap. You bet. Yeah. You you see what I'm saying? Oh, I yeah. walked into a trap, but that's okay, because I had sworn, you know, when I was on the White House detail that I would give my life to the president, but it led to uh, trials and tribulations uh, on, my, uh, on my part that no citizen of the United States of America should have to suffer. I was, uh, there were attempts to declare me insane while I was in custody. I was forced to take psychotropic drugs, and uh, they did everything that they could to make sure that I never returned to society with a sane mind. So, uh, but here I am today happily talking to you, Jeff and Jim Mars, my good friend, and I thank the Lord for that. How, how long were you locked away? I was locked away three years and three months. Three years and three months. Uh, I was in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana for a while. I went mm-hmm. to Fort Leavenworth for mm-hmm. a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, I uh, went to um, Montgomery, uh, Alabama for a while. They and, shuffled and, you around, I guess. It, yes, yes. Yeah. They kind of shuffled me around. Uh, but mm-hmm. at Springfield Medical Center for Federal Prisoners, that's where they sprung their big... Uh, their, their, their big hoax of trying to uh, declare me insane. And uh, it didn't work, uh, thank God. You can see that it didn't work. I'm you, you, of course, uh, absolutely. You were offered, I guess, ultimately, a deal uh, to get this dismissed or somehow reduced, but you want a full pardon. You're not, you're not going to make any deals. I want expunging of the record because uh, they're getting a, a, a pardon uh, I would only accept it uh, without any criteria that I make a statement of, that I'm guilty of any crime that I did not commit. Mm-hmm. I would rather die and rot in my grave than, than say that I did something that even the government witness said I didn't do. You know, we had a confession uh-huh. of perjury in my trial. Uh, and the uh, U.S. attorney that was handling the case took the Fifth Amendment when asked whether or not he had falsified this case against me. Uh, he took the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination. That must have made Jeff, sense. Jeff, you have yeah. to understand, he, he's not looking for a pardon, because a pardon uh, it, it, you know, gives the implication implies, that he's, implies, he's, implies, implies he's, he's guilty in the guilty, first place. I and understand. he's being pardoned for it. He says he was not guilty, he's never been guilty, yeah. so he wants an yeah. exoneration. Okay? That's not, he just wants the whole thing yeah. cleared up and... I, I assume well, thank you. That's I think why I think he's doing an apology, but I, you know. Oh, he's doing more than that. That's why I brought the word up, because it's not applicable here. The man is guilty of nothing. And to expunge the record, and I'll go further, this man needs to be compensated for three years and three months of his life that was taken away from him, not to mention the terror he was subjected to, which is exactly what it was. Yeah, but let me throw this in, knowing uh, Abraham Bolden as I do. Uh, he is a good Christian man. He's not in it for any money. I understand. He, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, no, want I know, money. I know. He, he just wants to be exonerated. Well, the only reason I ra- raise that is because a man of his religious and spiritual conviction could use that money for good, and I know he would, should there be some compensation. How can we help Abraham? Well, we, we need to obviously click on your name and go to your website. I guess the whole thing is there. How do we go about helping you getting your record cleansed well i think that the the more uh, people that uh, write in and write the president uh sign the petition that that's uh on i think it's one on your website now isn't it yes it's connected right to your name and, yes uh, it's connected right to my name on on your website and uh they can also as a matter of fact the website is www.echofromdealyplaza.net that's www.echofromdealyplaza.net. And the name of my book is Echo from Dealey Plaza, so you, can, you can't forget that. I appreciate it if the people would, you know, purchase my book and read about it, because after all, the American people deserve to know the truth about this. This has been a cancer on America for the last 50 years. And as I said before, they deserve to know the truth if we're going to be a constitutional democracy. I want to thank you on behalf of, of, of America, of our great people, 
for serving our country and continuing to serve the highest principles of American patriotism. Abraham Bolden, you're a remarkable man. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Jim, uh, goodbye. I'll be talking with you maybe in November. Okay, I hope to see you in Dallas. All right, then. Good night. And Jim, thank you for making this possible. That was just extraordinary. Yeah, well, this is an extraordinary story. Indeed. Indeed it is. All right, talk soon, my friend. Okay, bye. All right, good night. All right, that's hour one.